Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, it's a new week. We're continuing to look at Daniel chapter 11. I have some interesting mistakes that I've made, which are going to be neat to look at. We can see what the significance of them is. And um, uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have each morning to study your word together. And we just invite your spirit to be here as we open your word. That the spirit that inspired uh, the scriptures can speak to us. And that you can teach us and correct us and guide and lead us. We pray for each person studying these things. And we ask that you can work in their lives in a powerful way. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. I mean, <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. Not many people here yet. We had a time change. So we uh, relived from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, here because they changed, they turned the clock back at 2 o'clock back to 1. And so it brings everything uh for people who didn't have a time change, it brings everything an hour later for them, if that makes sense. I know time changes can be confusing. Now, um, so I want to look at a couple of things first. Um, so I'm going to go back and look at some mistakes that I made. And they're kind of interesting mistakes. So what we had been doing is looking at these verses and looking at what these Hebrew numbers added up to. So now these weren't a primary part of our interpretation of these verses. They were just more a reaffirmation of the significance of these verses. Now, when we look at Daniel 11.9, we have um, this uh, passage here. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. And if we add up the numbers, the Hebrew numbers of the words, so there's uh, seven words in that sentence, we're going to get the number uh, what? What number do we get? Does anybody remember? Let's see if you can remember numbers. So it's 23,111. And I've, I've done this here on this sheet. So I'm just going to show you this. It's a lot easier for you to see this. Okay. So this is just um, an Excel spreadsheet. What I have at the top here is, you can see, here's Daniel 11, verse 9. I have it. And these are the seven words that are in there. Right. And, and then I just summed the column. Now, I remember when I originally subbed the column, the last word, it didn't add it, right? Um, so I had to correct that. And I guess that problem has existed with each of these columns, which is kind of frustrating. But anyway, we looked at that verse and we saw that this number, 23,111, is 11 times 11 times 191. So these numbers are significant. Obviously, this key verse um, the key verse in Daniel 11, the Battle of Raphia, is, you know, verse 11, 11. And you can see that the last word in that column is the Hebrew number 127. So that's the last word in the verse. Um, now, sometimes these verses are in a different order in Hebrew than they are in English, but not always, right? So sometimes the word order is different. In this case, it's the same word at the end. Now, what was the significance of the number 127? It's a different iteration of 721. Yeah, it's July 18th or July 21st backwards, right? It also reminds us of 217, right? Which is what? 1111 is about, that is, 217 B.C., the Battle of Raphia. We know 12 times 7 is on the 1843 chart to be 84, times 30 to be 2520, right? So 
Um, so that last word in the sentence becomes an important word. It, it, it becomes, in a sense, a symbol, right? Now, if I had the number uh, 23,111 and I didn't have that added to it, so I just subtract that, obviously it's going to be 22,984. Now, uh, this number itself um, is, you know, it's 16 less than 23,000. Um, right, so what am I doing? Um, This is a number that, um, if you look at the divisors, it, it doesn't have as much interest. It's it's um, eight times thirteen times thirteen times seven, or two times two times two times thirteen times thirteen times seven is the factorization. And no divisors that are significant in and of themselves that I can see. Um, you know, I mean, other than thirteen or fifty-two. So, so the number itself doesn't mean anything as a symbol. Okay. And then we have, um, if we took it as a span of time, 62 years and uh, Sixty-two years and three hundred and forty days. So twenty-two thousand um, nine hundred and eighty-four. Um, I'm just doing some things here. <clears throat> Something wrong. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so anyway, that number here, the 23,111 is significant. Now, I looked at Daniel 1111, and I had taken the Hebrew numbers and put them in a column that you can see there. So you see the column. And then I said when I added them up, they added up to um, 67,940, which is 187 prophetic years in 20 days. But the problem was when I did the total, it didn't add the last word. So just as I did when I first did it with uh, 127. And um, so what I would do is I would, uh, you know, to check this out, I would add them up manually and check them out. Um, and, and then I would go like this. I'd collect these two columns and down on the bottom it will, it will add them together. And so sometimes it would work, but sometimes it didn't. And I'm not sure why. So this one adds it together. Um, so in this case, I would have to take the first 14 words and they would give me 187,000 prophetic years and 20 prophetic 20 days. But if I added the last word, which is hand, right? That's the number 3027. And that is um, eight prophetic years and 288 days. So 
you would have to add that to that total. So it would give you um, 196 or 195, pardon me, years and um, 308 days. So, so it doesn't work out. But the thing is, the number there, 3027, is a symbol of March 27th or 273. So if we just take out that last word, we have that total. But it, it sort of throws this whole thing off of what we were trying to do. And then I looked at Daniel 11, verse 40, and I got this number, 90,552. Well, this number here is, um, and what I need to do is go like this. Let me do this. I'm going to go sum. So you can see that's the auto sum. So it's not including the last word again, right? And so this last word, I'd have to actually sum these. I guess I go like this. I'm not sure how you do that. Um, is there some way to sum that? Maybe if I just get auto sum and change that. I don't know what that is. I was just going to sum the one. So I'd have to add. I'd have to add those together. So I could probably figure that out. So anyway, it's not going to be the number that I had. There. So that number was uh, the number of uh, hours in a week times 77 times 7. Now, what about this last number, 5674? I know this is probably boring for some people. Um, but 5674 as a number, does it have any significance? So that word, that word doesn't have any significance that I know of. That number for that word doesn't have any significance that I know of. But if we take out that last word of that sentence, we have this. So we have two verses. If we take out the last word, um, then we have a significance of that. Now, um, just looking at the Hebrew here. And that's the word to cross over a bar. Okay. So anyway, I had to correct those mistakes. And whether those mistakes are significant, the fact that I made them is interesting. Uh, but I make mistakes for some reason, even when I'm careful and double check and triple check. Okay. <clears throat> so now what I've done in this uh during the last study on Thursdays, I watched videos as much as I could of Chowatu and Kimberly presenting on Daniel chapter 11. Now, <clears throat> as we said before, the fact that they're doing these studies in 2017, prior to us having November 9th, 2019, and July 18, 2020, and all the experience that we've gone through, we can't expect them to see the lines the way that we do. But we know that what they did um, is part of this message and we need to understand it. So their view in how they apply these lines is that they take um, this history of, of the fall of, of, of the Greek empire and they parallel it to 1798 and to 1989. And the way that they do that is they have um, this one verse where it says, and the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him. They take that, of course, as Seleucid. Now, they say that it's one of his princes. The main reason they look at it that way is they're seeing that Seleucid is going to conquer three geographical locations. That is, he's going to conquer um, the Seleucid, what, what becomes the Seleucid Empire, 
And then he conquers Cassander and Lysimachus's territory. And so he has these three geographical locations that he overcomes. And we, um, so we parallel that. So we get a, a line where we're going to take this, this history and we're going to parallel this to uh, the line starting in uh, 538 to 1798. So it's, it's going to represent this line. So it's going to bring us to 1798. And, and then he creates another line which is going to be uh, a line that's going to end. Uh, and I'm trying to think of how that works. No. So, man, my mind's a bit fried looking at all this different stuff. So let's go back. So he's going to take that and parallel that with the papacy, right? So he's going to parallel that with the papacy. So he's doing this differently than we are, right? He's going to take, um, because the papacy is going to, uproot three geographical locations, right? And so we can see why he's doing that. And any thoughts on that? Chawatu is taking the uh, Seleucid. He's the king of the north, and he's going to conquer three geographical locations, right? He's going to conquer what? You know, Syria. Does that make sense to people, what he's doing there? Yes. Okay. All right. So, isn't he trying to establish the legitimacy of the Seleucid Empire and show the progression from Babylon to the Medes and the Persians to the Greeks? Well, yeah. So he's making a parallel. So he's saying that this history of the Greeks, right? It's going to move from Babylon, right? Because that's, even though the Persians are the Persian empire, they have Babylon. And when, I mean, that that's really the kingdom of Babylon in, in some ways, that's the way it's understood. The continuation of it. So, you know, Babylon is conquered and it, it becomes this huge empire under the Greeks, right? Under Alexander. And then his kingdom is going to be divided toward the four winds of heaven, right? And so in trying to understand that history, the way that we would just learn it is it was divided, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucid, and Ptolemy. That's how we would learn it in an evangelistic series, right? Just very, very simple, which it's going to get to that point. It doesn't start there, right? You're going to have right. a bunch of people having different territories, but eventually it's going to end up like that. And then ultimately, uh, Seleucid is going to conquer three geographical locations. Now, you have Antigonus, but it's not that simple. It's not like you have uh, Lysimachus, Cassander, and Antigonus. And, and they say, well, Seleucid is one of Ptolemy's princes. Well, they basically have an alliance. I mean, Seleucid doesn't have one of those divisions of Alexander's kingdom at the beginning. He's not given that, right? He's one of the generals, but he's not given that a division of the empire. And, and he's going to side with Ptolemy. He's going to make an alliance with Ptolemy. And ultimately, um, you're going to have uh, Antigonus, his empire, which at first is one of the bigger portions for a long time, because he lives to be 81. Um, and even though he's in his 60s when he uh, begins, but he's in his experience general, and he ends up taking up over most of that kingdom. But we never hear about, well, Antigonus is one of the four winds, right? They were one of the four groupings, because it's an earlier grouping, and eventually he's defeated while he dies, which is, and then, and then his kingdom is divided up. And his son, I think Demetrius or something like that, so it's a very complex history. As I started you know, going through and reading this history um, from all different kinds of perspectives, I was getting pretty confused. One is I'm not good with people's names. So if they were all just numbers, it'd be easier. But so you have this, this division of, of Rome. So what happens is Seleucus, he's going to conquer that area that he ends up with which is Syria and uh, the Col Syria. 
can think of name. And then you're going to have, and then he's going to conquer Lysimachus and uh, Cassander's empire. So eventually he's going to have the north. And Antigonus is the Antigonian, uh, which is Macedonia. I mean, it's still going to exist, but it's just not going to be part of the empire of the division of Greece. Right? So, so you have the king of the north, which is in relationship to, he's called the king of the north because from the Jews' perspective, he's in the north. And the king of the south, the Ptolemic Empire, that's in the south. So I don't know if it's that important whether one interprets it that one of his princes, because it is true that a Seleucid is one of the princes of Alexander. And it's true that he does have an alliance with Ptolemy. Right. But at some point, Seleucid, he's going to be strong above the king of the south. So I don't know if it's that huge a distinction. Uh, but he is going to con conquer those three geographical locations. Right. So we, we have that parallel to the papacy and and to Rome as well. Right. Because does Rome con conquer three geographical locations? Yes. Yeah. So we have these these patterns that at the beginning of their lines, they do this. Now, one of the things about the line upon line that I find interesting going through Chalitou's studies is that he's not doing line upon line that everything parallels Millerite history. That is, he's not using the model of what we call the seven thunders or whatever, the three angels' messages with the arrival, the formalization, empowerment, second message, arrival, formalization, empowerment, and then third angels' message arriving. He's not doing it in that way. He's using a model of, of basically of Rome and seeing that that model exists with Greece and the model exists, of course, with the papacy, and we have that same model at the time of the end. Right. So, so it's a different model, a different line than we're usually using in the context of line upon line. It is still seen that history repeats itself, but it's a little bit different than what we have been doing over the last few years. Now, there's also um, where he's he's not making a direct application in the videos that I've seen so far. To our time in the way that we are. That is, obviously, he's going to have 1989 as uh, this time of the end. Um, but he's, and, and I still have to sort through some of what he's doing because when he presents it, it looks really convincing and really straightforward. But when you actually start looking at it, you start to notice problems with it. And so I'm going to have to be able to present those, but we're not we're not we're not going to be able to do that all in one study. One is I don't understand it all yet. Um, now, the other thing that I did is um, I looked at a letter that Jeff wrote regarding Chalatu and Kimberly uh, back in 2017. So back in 2017. So if you remember on December 17th. Uh, Jeff is going to see a, present, a presentation by Chao Tu and Kimberly on uh, Raphia upon Daniel chapter 11. Now, and I guess he has read some of that prior to that meeting, so he's he's already understood what they're going to be presenting. Um, but they're going to do a complete study going through all of Daniel chapter 11. And it's going to go through the whole thing because they have a study that's comprehensive. It explains Daniel chapter 11. Now, there's problems with that study, and Jeff noticed problems with the study, but I'm not sure because he mentions them, and it has to do with the understanding of verse 16 and verse 23. And, and I still don't even understand what the problem was. It was that he was teaching something different than Jeff, but I don't know what Jeff was teaching that Chowatu was teaching differently. So if somebody knows that, that would be really, really helpful. 
Um, one of the things is watching these videos are very difficult because there's so much background noise. Um, and so I, the background noise is louder than the people who are doing the presentation, Chow to and Kimberly. So, so that makes it hard to listen to. It's hard to concentrate on it. I have to be really attentive. So it tires me out watching the video. Um, so anyway, with verse 16, we, we have this verse where he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. So who is this in Daniel 11, verse 16? Who do we understand this to be? He that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. Well, we know the Pope does according to his own will, but this is prior to the Pope, right? This is Rome, right? Yeah, so this is prior to the Pope. So this is Rome. This is pagan Rome, right? Um, so when he shall stand in the glorious land, that's going to be Pompey, right? Six sixty-five BC. Correct? Because remember in verse 14, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall, right? So Rome enters the picture there to establish the vision. And and then and so the king of the north here is Rome, right? That's that's the way that we understand this. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure particularly what the issue was because I don't know what Tek Chao Tu taught on this verse yet. And then the other verse was verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall be strong with a small people. Right. So with the arms of a flood, shall they be overflown from before him? He shall be broken. Verse 22. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after a league made with him, he shall work deceitfully for he shall come up and shall be strong with a small people. So we know this is going to be the time, obviously. Where? What, what is this? This league? In 23? Uh this league, is it not uh, with the Jews and Rome? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the league made with the Jews and the Rome and Rome. But we're saying that um, here back in verse 16, uh, he shall stand in the glorious land. We're saying that that's 65, right? So there would have to be a repeat and enlarge. So I would think possibly what is occurring um in Chowatu's interpretation, just as a guess, is that he's not doing that, that he's not connecting this with uh, uh, pagan Rome conquering Jerusalem. But I don't know. So I have to look at it. So some of these things that when I, part of the problem is I'm reading so many different views and opinions on Daniel chapter 11 um, and getting all kinds of background information but I'm still having trouble sorting it out, but we're going to sort it out together. So, so the, the, those are issues that we would have with Chow Tu's and Kimberly, but Jeff had issue with. We'd have to see, well, maybe Chow Tu was correct and maybe Jeff was wrong. It's always possible. Um, and, and I find it weird reading this letter from 2017 because uh, most of the information that Jeff's getting about Chowatu is coming from Parminder. Now, Jeff does do some email exchange with Chowatu, but by the time he does, there's a lot of tension between them. Um, so Jeff is fairly accusatory and Chowatu is fairly defensive. And so, um, and, and the things that they're discussing don't really make much sense because they're just politics that was going on between these different groups. And Chalatu was claiming that Parminder had a, a kingly 
kingly power is exercising kingly power. And of course, Jeff at that time is not going to recognize it. Jeff later will recognize, and he actually does make an apology. He says, you know, we obviously need to apologize to Chowatu for how he was treated because he didn't know what was going on. He was just going by the information, the sources that he had, and they were distorting his perception about Chowatu. And I had something very similar happen with me and Jeff. So, um, so I understand how that happens. If you have a person suspicious and they're receiving information and you're not, they're not trusting the person that they're talking to, that is based on this other information that they have, that what the person's telling them is can't be true because somebody told them something different, even though the person themselves would know what they think. Jeff at times would just think that that person's being deceptive. And I don't think that I seen that in Chow Tu. I think Chow Tu was extremely naive. You know, he believed that he would just be accepted um, in the role that he believed that he had, that God had given him to give this, this insight. And, um, and he was really caught off guard when uh, the movement rejected him. And I don't know what Chow Tu is doing today. But he's never responded to any of my emails. But, um, you know, so I look at Chow too and as somebody who's, who's very gifted, gifted in presentations. Uh, he can make things a lot simpler than I can. But also there was things, you know, problems that existed uh, with his inability to take the rejection that he received. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to ask of somebody. But sometimes when you get it caught off guard, it can be difficult. So, um, so those are the types of things that we're dealing with. So we're looking at, and, and I don't know if I want to go through in detail what Chow Tu presented, but I would just say that there are differences. And those differences, I would mostly attribute just to the lack of understanding of our lines back in 2017. And one of the things that I see as a problem that we were having with our lines is that Parminder had thrown into the mix uh, confusion regarding the lines. That was that means we weren't understanding how the lines were constructed. We didn't understand that um, we needed to use the Millerite model very much to guide us in interpreting the lines. And we didn't understand how we zoom into the lines. We didn't understand the connection obviously between uh, 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel and November 9th, 2019, as the arrival of the second angel, that those are parallel histories. Um, we just didn't understand that because we didn't even have November 9th, 2019. So there's no way that we can we can take everything that Chao Tu had done and just say it is all correct because it's different. Right. It's different than what Jeff was doing. It's different than what we have done. Uh, and he wants the thing to be flowing uh, from what I've seen, just flowing chronologically. So that each event is the next event. And without any repeat and enlarge. Now, um, because when we go back to verse 14, so let's just look here. So when the robbers of the people shall exact, exalt themselves to establish the vision, um, this is going to be um, when, when we go here, it's going to be Rome is going to come in. So Rome spoke and Syria and Macedonia soon found a change coming over the aspect of their dream. The Romans interfered in behalf of the young king of Egypt determined that he should be protected from the room devised by Antiochus and Philip. And this was 200 BC. It was one of the first important inferences, uh, interferences of the Romans in the affairs of Syria and Egypt, right? So we're going to have that happen, right? We're going to have this interference of Rome. So Rome enters the picture. So then here um, in this part, um, so it says the education of the young king of Egypt was entrusted by the Roman Senate, Senate uh, to 
I'm not sure what M stands for, Emilus Lepidus, who appointed Aristomenes, an old and experienced minister of that court, to be his guardian, right? So uh, when you're dealing with this, and then we come to verse 16, uh, so this Rome conquers Syria and Palestine. So it's good, he's going to be bringing this, the conquering of Rome. So he's introducing Rome in the book of Daniel. Rome is introduced, and it's going to be brought to the point where he stands in the glorious land, right? But it's going to have this... Um, we have to go to verse 23 to get this league. So I'm just trying to get my mouse to work here. Um, so it says, after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So they're going to go all the way back to the league in 161, 158. Right. But this is going to be once you have uh, the Prince of the Covenant here. Um, who's going to confirm the covenant. So so this history here. So the problem is that we're going to have as we progress, I guess, is we're going to have to sort out. Is your eye Smith correct? Is there some other way that we can look at this? Um, because this league. You, which is made earlier, is going to be mentioned later after the Prince of the Covenant. So the question is, why would that be? I know this is kind of a, a little bit scattered. So this arms of a flood, they're going to take this as... Um, this is going to be dealing with the crucifixion. Takes place in the reign of Tiberius. John the Baptist began his ministry. Um, so, And then it says, after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. So why, why do they mention this league here after mentioning the prince of the covenant? The crucifixion. Why does he take us back to this time? No, I think uh, there we can see a combination of uh, church and state. Okay, so so we're brought back to this time of this league, right? So the league is going to be in verse fourteen. Then it's going to come to the time of the crucifixion under. Uh, Tiberius, and then it says, after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall be strong with a small people. So why do they, why do they, why do they go back to the league when we're in the time of Christ and the crucifixion? So Uriah Smith has an explanation, which I think is fairly good. He just says, once Rome is introduced, they're going to bring them all the way up to the time of the crucifixion and then go back to the league. But the question is still, why do they do that? What's being, what's being contrasted here? What is a league? Well, it's a pact that two two of our groups will sign. Okay. Is it a covenant? Had, had not Rome 
Yeah, and had not Rome been so ensconced among the Jews, then they wouldn't have been around when Christ was crucified. There would have been another power, maybe Syria, who knows? Right, so because of this league, Christ is going to be crucified under a Roman government, right? But he's, go he's also the prince of the covenant. So we have a covenant of man, and we have a covenant between God and man. And so it's going to say, from this league, it's going to bring us back up, but then it's going to go back to the time of the league again, right? So, so it's been the subject of prophecy from there. So it's going to say, after league with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall become strong with a small people. That's Rome, right? He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. So this is Rome, right? Right. And we're going to know about the battle here uh, with Rome, with Egypt, right? You're going to have the whole situation there with uh, Mark Anthony, right? Augustus Caesar and Lepidus, the Triumvirate, and all the things having to do with um, Cleopatra and stuff in conquering Egypt. Okay, so those are the things that we understand that, uh, you know, we've gone through these before. But in doing this, we have to we have to understand that it goes back. Now, does that happen in our history? That um, the king of the north comes into the picture ahead of his time, so to speak. Because when does the papacy really come into its history? When does its deadly wound heal? Uh, is it uh, not at the Sunday law? Yeah, it's at the Sunday law. But has the papacy come into the picture earlier? Yes, we find that uh, he's been given the uh, back his uh, state. That's uh, 1920. Is it 29 well, or 2021? Yeah, I think 21 or something. But I, I would think that where we where we have the papacy come into play in at the time of the end is more in connection with the league that's made with with reagan right yes 1989 yeah well even before that because that's going to be in the 80s so the pope yes, and yes. Reagan are going to make an agreement uh that they're going to make this plan so that they can overthrow the soviet union that is what they're planning to do and they were success successful in that so they made a league in that history, and the United States, in this case, makes a league with Rome, right? And it's going to cause, ultimately, their overthrow. But it doesn't do that at first. In a sense, they first come against the king of the south, right? So they're going to come and conquer the king of the south. So, so we can see that there is these parallels, but I'm not really satisfied that we understand this history well. That is, as I, because I've gone through this many times. I've gone through Daniel chapter 11. I've read books on it. I have like Tidings from the Northeast. I've gone through that book. Um, I've gone through uh, the studies as a group. We did that back in 2020, in 2020. We went through. Uh, Daniel chapter 11. I know Stephen is researching and writing stuff on Daniel chapter 11. He's, he's researching it. And he's going to come up with different things than me because I know Stephen always does. Sometimes he's right. Sometimes he's wrong because we all make mistakes. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. As you know, I make mistakes. Um, so, so we're going to have to 
really figure out how to do this. Now, one of the things, yeah, 1929, and that's the Vatican City restored in the Alatrian Treaty, 1929. That was actually, 1921 was uh, dealing with the fall of uh, Turkey. So 1929, um, the Lateran Treaty. Now, I'm going to show you some things here, if I can find them. Okay. So this is just a little chart having the kings of the south and the kings of the north. Okay, this bigger. Just want to make it bigger. No idea why. Okay, so you can see the list, you know, the Ptolemy the first, or Ptolemy the first, pardon me, Soter, and Seleucus the first, Nicator, and so they have these names attached to them. Um, Ptolemy the second, Philadelphus, right, you're going to see the times in which they overlap, they're just listing them, trying to get them so that they overlap, you can see the overlap, because um, they're obviously, um, they're all going to be um, and you're going to see like Seleucus, he's not going to be um, until 312 that he becomes the king of the north, right? Where Ptolemy the first Soter, right away he asks for Egypt um, when they divide the kingdom. Because they have that guy, uh, Persipicus or something like that, who's in charge of dividing up the territories to the different generals. And so Ptolemy gets his in 323. Seleucus, it's not till 312. So it's going to be like 11 years later that he finally, um, you know, is one of the, the four uh, generals. And, um, you know, then he's going to be the king of the north. So you have the Seleucid Empire there. And then you're going to have a lot of Antiochuses and Seleucuses, which makes it even much more difficult to remember them. Um, Soter, Theanus, Callinicus, Serenus the Great, Tychus the Third the Great, Philopater, Epiphanes, Tychus Epiphanes, which we're all familiar with, and Upater, the last one there. Um, so there's going to be more in that list, but they're just bringing it up to like 150 BC. And then you can see over here on the left, the Ptolemies. Um, finally, you're going to have Cleopatra as the head of Egypt. So it's going to be all Ptolemies, 1st, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, right? All the way up to 51 BC. So you're going to have more. I don't know what all the names are. Um, so in this history, we can see there's these two histories, and it's really hard, for me at least, to keep track of who's who, what battles they fought. So... It would be nice to have them all in chronological order, these events. So I do have um, some diagrams that are putting together to make them easier to see. I have some, but they're too, they're not very good. So I'm going to try to put that together. Now, one of the things that um, Chow Tu does is he does nicely put the events. Now, one of the events is one that we've looked at already, and that has to do with Berenice, or Berenice, however you say it. She's the one who is going to be the daughter of the king of the south, right? So um, so the king's daughter of the south, she'll come to the king of the north. Now, this is in 252 BC. Now, we have a symbol there, 252, which relates to 2520. And we know, like, 217 for Rafi is important. But when we were taking this symbol, how were we taking this daughter of the king of the south? How were we applying it on our time? I mean, we know who it is. It's you know, the daughter of, of the king of Egypt. This is the league that they're going to make in 252 uh, with each other. Right? That's going to be this agreement at the end of all of these battles. So it's a peace agreement. But how did we look at the daughter of the king of the south? Well, 
Where did we apply it? Didn't we apply it that it's more of a religious situation than strictly a, a daughter? Right. So we're saying that this is a religious philosophy. It's wokeism, right? Now, one, one point. Yeah. Have you noticed the mistake in this chart? Um, well, is it a spelling mistake or a year mistake? Ptolemy the fourth was Ptolemy Philopater, not Epiphanes. Oh yeah. Ptolemy the fifth is Epiphanes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That. Okay. So that should be Philopater, right? And okay. So it's for me. It's kind of interesting as I look at this because Ptolemy Epiphanes. In the Egyptian line, precedes Antiochus Epiphanes in the north. Okay, so the, yeah. Yeah, because that's 203 to 181. Antiochus Epiphanes is 175 to 164, so. And it's for me, it's intriguing because it could be Epiphanes or the other way that they would they would state this because Epiphanes is supposed to be uh, Ptolemy the Savior. And if it's pronounced the other way, it's Ptolemy the Madman. So that's number four, you're saying? Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why they made this typo on there. You know, you'd think people would make mistakes. Stuff happens. Yeah, well, I make mistakes all the time. Yeah, so trying to keep everything straight, and we 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 make mistakes. So, um, so anyway, we have. We have so trying to keep track of this, especially since I just I'm terrible with names. This is like the hardest thing for me to do. Keep track of of who these people are, especially when they're all kind of named the same. Um, you know, maybe if I focused on the number, but still, it's it's confusing because you're reading Ptolemy, Seleucus, and Tychus. So so you know we need to get these straightened out. Um, but anyway, when we go back to uh, to this, we can, to verse six. So we have the king's daughter of the south, and we're saying that this is a religious philosophy, that this is wokeism. Now, obviously, Chawatu isn't going to make that application to our time. And when we were doing this, so way back when we were, so I'm going to go back because 2017, um, I'm going to show you the chart that I have. Now, this this is adapted from the book by, um, uh, so this is a paper I started, Daniel Levin, Historical and Present Truth Applications. But I took the historical applications from a, a book by, uh, I can't think of the guy's name, um, Here, I'll tell you what the book is called. Uh, well, it's Tidings Out of the Northeast, and it's by Swearington. That's the guy's name. Um, so, so he had this list, and I basically just copied it. And then what I did is I, I put in red the things that I've added, and I changed some things. So in the third year, 536 BC equals 1991. So we're going to... That's how I lined it up. Um, so Bush the first, the king of, e of USA, right? He's Cyrus, king of Persia. We're going to parallel Cyrus to Bush the first, king of, of USA. So 
we go through each of these verses, verses 1 to 2, right? In the first year of Darius, so that was 10 verse 1. So we go to 11 verse 1. Also I, the angel Gabriel, in the first year, 538, which is 1989. So I've just put that, that year of Darius the Mede. So technically it would be, you know, 539. And, and I'm going to put that Reagan. There. So Reagan and Darius the Mede line up. I even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. In BC's false murders and Darius the first, Clinton, Bush the second, and Obama. Now, one of the things interesting here that I found um, rather odd. So this book by Swearington, where I get this from, he he puts an alternative to this list, saying, well, false murders um, isn't really important. And then, you know, so the fourth is going to be Artaxerxes. Now, he says, you know, we don't know which it would be, but we're, we're clear from when we study the book of Ezra, is false smyrtus listed as a king of Persia in the Bible? In Ezra chapter 4, he doesn't name, he call him false smyrtus, he calls him uh, Artaxerxes, I think, or can't remember which one, Cambyses, I think, maybe Cambyses. Yes, he is listed. Yeah, so he's listed, and Ellen White says it's him, right? So, so there's no way that we could take this other list. I mean, this is according to the scripture of truth. These are the kings of Persia according to the Bible. It doesn't matter what somebody else later on thinks that false murders wasn't really a, a real king or that he was invented um, by Darius. He never even existed. It was just an excuse for him to take over the throne, um, things like that. When the Bible clearly marks that he's there, he's the one that stops the construction of the temple. So, so we have to have him in there. So it's just a point that, to me, that Swearington just misses, even though it's quite a good book on Daniel chapter 11. It shows our limitation of understanding of these histories. You know, he, he just probably has never really studied Ezra in detail to know this. Okay. So we got um, Clinton, Bush II, and Obama that parallels them. And then the fourth, Xerxes is Trump. He shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. That's the Greek empire. And then we put here, globalists, Russia. Now, this is 2017 that I put this together. So I wouldn't put globalists, Russia now, right? We would have to say the globalists, um, we could say UN, right? But we could also just say the Democrats. But the Trump is against the globalists. We could even just put Democrats in here, right? But that would not have been seen by Chalitou in 2017, right? We're going to be thinking the globalist Russia. Okay. Make sense? So now this next part, this is 2017. So this is really Jeff's view. And a mighty king, Alexander the Great, Trump shall stand up. He shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. will conquer vast territory is what uh, a Swearington put in there, which I put equals head of UN, because that's what Jeff was saying. Trump's going to become the head of the UN. And when he shall stand up at the height of his power, Sunday law, national apostasy, his kingdom shall be broken. His death, 323 BC. Now, but you can see how this doesn't make sense based on what we study, because we're going to say, Alexander the Great, his kingdom is represented or paralleled with the USSR, right? This is 1989 again, because Persia shows our history with these kings, and now we go back to Greece, and it's going to show us this history again. 
So um, when he shall stand up, he shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So we're going to put this not to conquering a vast territory. This is going to be, um, uh, well, in that case, you know, it'd be vast territory there. But we're going to look at this as the Syria, Sir, how do you call that? Uh, uh, it's going to be the, um, Soviet, um, Afghan war, right? That's how you spell Afghan. It's an F. There we go. G H. There we go. Afghan war. Okay. And when he shall stand up at the height of his power, now we have Sunday law, national apostasy, because we have the United States here. But that doesn't make any sense. Right? So when he shall stand up, that's going to be at the end of that period, his kingdom shall be broken. So at the height of his power, we would say, so this is going to be um, 1989, right? That war is going to end, right? And his kingdom uh, shall be broken. So I put here in his death, 723 BC, but we're going to see here, this is going to be, um, yeah, we could have put, uh, you know, we could have put November 9th, 1989, and then we could put uh, December 25th, 1991. So do that. Okay, so when we do this here, when we when we go through this and we finally get this, I want to use this. Um, to me, this is a useful tool to go through these verses and put this in. So we're going to work through this. We're going to get this refined. Um, so then it says, and he shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. Now, you can see here, we got the four Hellenistic empires, the UN. Well, how do we how do we look at this here? Is this how we would understand it? Because Alexander's kingdom is going to be divided towards the four winds of heaven. So how would we apply that verse? So that's what happens historically. How would we apply it in our time? Anybody have an idea how we would do this? I know Dwight disappeared. So. so a lot of these things don't make sense that I put in there because they were based upon Trump being this here. So if we're taking that the, this is the Soviet Union, that it's going to fall and divided towards the four winds of heaven. these four Hellenistic empires, uh, how would we understand this in our life? What are the four winds of heaven symbolizing? Uh, is it uh, not the winds uh, symbolizing Islam? Yeah, so we know that Islam is part of that, right? So we just had the Soviet-Afghan war, right? That's going to be uh, this thing that the Soviet Union, it's exerting its power. It's conquering territory, at least it's trying to. He stands up at the height of his power, November 9th, 1989. Now, we know that the war ends on February 15th, 1989. On November 9th, he stands up at the height of his power, and then his kingdom shall be broken. 
right? And that's going to be in that period of 777 days to December 25th, 1999. And then his kingdom is divided towards the four winds of heaven. Now, that is, of course, Greece. Now, I don't think it would be bad to say that that is the UN. But we know that this is, is something more when we deal with the four winds of heaven, if we're applying it in our time. That definitely this has to do with this um, with Islam, right? That the four winds are going to be held back. So um, instead of just putting the UN there, right, what we did is we placed this at 9-11, right? Right. Okay. And we have the UN there because the UN is, is going to be there at 9-11. But it's going to be this conflict with Islam that brings the UN in there. So not to his posterity. Now it says Alexander had no legitimate heirs, right? So we have their, I had their constitution, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, so if we look at the Soviet Union, it's being passed to the UN, right? Not to his posterity. But so probably what I would put here, instead of the UN here, you know, I could simply just put that here. So we would just say the UN, right? Now we're going to add the UN in here a little bit more. So not according to the dominion which he ruled, his former kingdom. So maybe what I would do, but under one ruler. So I'm just going to get rid of that. I'm just going to get rid of this completely. Just, we know it wasn't to his posterity, his children, but according to his dominion, which he ruled, his former kingdom would not be under one ruler, is what he says. But we can see now that uh, we have the UN. So you could say, well, Russia is divided into these different uh, parts, that, and the UN is responsible for some of that division, as well as the United States and Europe in, in creating this division. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides theirs, those, the four former generals of Alexander, Ptolemy, Cassander, Lysimachus, and Seleucus. So again, I put UN in there. So it's just, this is about the Soviet Union degenerating and that the UN taking over that aspect of, of that kingdom of the USSR. So the king of the South, Ptolemy the First Soter. Now, so back then, the way that I was looking at this is that I'm going to look at France in 538. But you can see that's not a present truth application. That's not wrong, right? This is sort of the view that, that we were teaching. We would take this history and we would compare what happens with the papacy later on. But we haven't made this application in our study, right? We're going to bring this to where? Where are we going to where are we going to start with this? In verse five, and the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he, which is Seleucus, shall be strong above him, is above Ptolemy, and have dominion in the territory of Syria. His dominion shall be a great dominion, largest territory of the Hellenistic empires. And in the end of years, after the first and second Syrian wars, the Ptolemy II of Philadelphia and Antiochus I Soter shall join themselves together, conclude peace in 252 BC, the Treaty of Tolentino. Right? For the king's daughter, Berenice, daughter of Ptolemy II of the south of Egypt, shall come to the king of the north, Antiochus II, the Assyrian. Right? So when we start to look at this, we're not making an application in the present truth application as France in 538. That would be an application. There is a parallel there. And that's sort of what uh, we're going to see with um, uh, Chawatu's presentation. He's going to be looking at that parallel. But the king of the south here, who do we say the king of the south is? In our time. Where, where are we placing this history? Mm 
And you're talking about the king of the south. Yeah, the king of the south. So originally they replaced it as Russia, wouldn't it? Japan. No. No. Russia is not the king of the south. Whether well, you're in Japan. now, right? You talking about now or are you talking about when this was done? Okay, so back then, uh, yeah, so I'm talking about how we would understand it now. In a bit of you in then. Okay. So, so, well, where are we going to place this then? Where are we placing this verse? Because we're going to have this to be, um, because we're going to have this, uh, the daughter of the king of the south. This is going to be this philosophy that's going to come in. So, so we've already had this the Soviet Afghan war. It's going to bring us to 9-11, right? And now we have to say, well, this is continuing. So this is going into our history. Right? So this is going into our history. So the king of the south shall be strong in one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion in the territory of Syria. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And at the end of years, right, we're going to say that, that they're going to join themselves together. They're going to have this league. This, now, the Treaty of Tolentino is, um, is um, what's the Treaty of Tolentino? Why, why did I have that in there? What is that? Because that's going to be in American history, right? That's going to be in the 19th of February, 1797. So you can see how we were doing these things. This, this is not a present truth application. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a parallel, but this is not where we're. So where would we put this 252? We would have to put it at 911, right? Wouldn't be, would that be where we would put it, where they join themselves together? That's going to be where Berenice, the daughter of the, the king's daughter of the south, shall come to the king of the north. And uh, so wh where can we put the reunion, like uh, the divorce, whereby, again, he's taking back the wife, and the wife now is the one who is going to be responsible for the death of uh, Bernice. Okay, so you're talking about when Laodice, um, she's going to lose her position, she's going to be divorced? No, when she's coming back, because she's the one who's responsible now for, for what will, will occur there. Yeah, she, Laodice is going to execute Berenice. Yes, okay. so the husband and also Berenice. Um, so she's assassinated, neither shall he, Atticus, stand, assassinated by Laodice, nor her his arm, Berenice's son. But she, Berenice, shall be given up, executed by Laodice, and they that brought her, executed by her attendees also. And he that begat her, she begat her son. And they that strengthened um, her in these times. So when we look at the historical view, we're saying if we're going to make a parallel to our time, at first, we're going to have the daughter of the king of the south is going to be taken and Laodice is going to be um, lose her position. She's going to be exiled, right? But then, right. Yeah. But then Berenice, she's not going to be able to stand. She's not going to retain the power of her arm. Uh, neither shall Antiochus the second stand, but he's going to be assassinated, and. Uh, Berenice's sons are going to be assassinated. And then Berenice herself will be executed. So that means Laodicea or Laodice, she's going to 
So what would she represent? Because if she was exiled and then she comes in and because these these are churches, they're representing a spiritual power or a church, not a political power. Yes, is she not uh, going to represent the the papacy, or should we say the no? We can't say the evangelicals, but the way that I see, like the papacy. Um, so she represents Protestants. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yes, 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 yes. The the daughters. Okay. Yeah. Right, so this is because we have the daughter of the king of the south, which is is sort of a new age wokeism and all that kind of stuff. But then those things are going to be turned against, right? So, so there's going to be the tide is going to change in the philosophy of the world. Right now, the world is run run by wokeism, but it's not going to stand. Right. So it's not going to be the thing that's going to bring about the Sunday law or it's it's going to be you know the religious right, so to speak. The, the Christianity, it's not going to be an atheistic power that's going to bring in the Sunday law. It's going to be a Christian power. Now, we know that the South is going to, you know, the UN, the world is going to join in that. Right, they're going to join in that. That is, the tide will turn for whatever reasons. But these things are not going to continue. Because if we worry about, see, because the problem is that many Adventists are not happy with what's happening in the world, right? Many Christians aren't. And, but yet the principles of Christ, the gospel is what's to be used to fight against evil. And yet, Christians are using politics. Christians are becoming very political against all of these things. And they believe, you know, if they get a strong leader in the United States and we and, and in the various countries of the world that we elect conservative governments um, and get rid of some of this silliness, then, you know, the world's just going to be a better place. But we know that that's not how things work. You know, the people who are speaking of, you know, uh, free speech and the rights of the individual and the Constitution now, once they're in power again, are they going to be interested in free speech, um, you know, and the Constitution and the rights of the individual? No, they're not. No, because it is a philosophical war. And the ones who aren't in control will always be speaking of free speech. But the ones who, you know, and the ones who are in control, doesn't matter who it is, they will be, they, and they will take the weapons that were used against them and they will use them, believing that it's justified. Right. So it's nice to sit, you know, watch YouTube videos and see, you know, conservative pundits talking about you know, free speech and all this. But they're going to be just the same once they're in power again. You know, ultimately. The backlash is going to be just as extreme as what we see. And it might even get more extreme before we get that backlash. So, you know, we don't like it that, um, you know, that wokeism is doing what it's doing. And we think that if, you know, conservatives are in charge, that we can we can make things better. The world will be a better place and everything will be just fine. But we know that's not going to happen. So, so Laodice coming back. And executing this, we can see the extreme in which this is done. So that's how we would look at this. And we're going to have to add things in here and try to, uh, you know, put these in here. But out of the branch of her, Beonir sees roots, family show one, Ptolemy the third, Eurogetes. Now I put here Napoleon, right? 
So in this interpretation that I had for the present truth application, it was actually addressing, you know, the time of the end in 1798. Now, of course, we can see, we can make a parallel. We can say, well, this is the time of the end in 1798, and it's in our time in 1989. And we've made that parallel between that history and our history. But remember, a lot of this is Parminder and Tess's stuff as well, right? So there's a lot of confusion in here. And, and we're still confused. We still don't fully understand these things. We're still trying to sort through them. But I think the idea is that once we get through Daniel chapter 11, we should be able to recognize that that past history applies directly to ours. So, you know, we wouldn't put Napoleon in there. And we wouldn't put uh, assume the throne of Egypt equals France because that's not present truth. All right. So so those are the things that we have to we have to do. So this is mostly just um, Swearington's list of all these verses. And and I think it would be good to have this whole list so that we have an easy access to understanding this in the present truth application and and in the historical application. Now, can there be other applications be made? Yes. But I think we have to understand this in the context of our times. So when I was going through this, I kept running into problems. One is I started this in 2017 and, and then started working on it again in 2018 and also in uh, 2020 when we went through Daniel chapter 11. And even though I'm good at chronology and stuff like that, this kind of history I find very confusing. And I'm sure many of you do too, to keep it all straight. Um, so we're going to have to make an application of that. So when we have out of the branch of her Berenice's root, shall one, Ptolemy the third year of Judy's, stand up in, it, in his estate, assume the throne of Egypt. How are we going to parallel that to our history? Right. Now, we already sort of made an application, but we want to understand it better. So any other thoughts on what we've done here so far? I mean, does this make sense to go in this direction? To, to fill out this chart? People think that would be useful? Yes, I think it would clarify things. Yeah, so, I mean... I want to have as much visual aids as possible. Obviously, we're going to have the lines drawn out and we're going to have um, the names of the kings and, and those things uh, drawn out. And the chronological line, what I want is just the chronology of events. You know, what, what was the next event? What was the next event? And the verses that it supports. Um, because I think we need to understand Daniel chapter 11, not just be familiar with it a little bit. We need to be able to read it and remember what it's talking about. We need to remember the actual history, but also how we're applying it in the present time. So I'm a little tired. I got up at two this morning, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop now because my mind's not working that well. And you can see it's a little bit scattered of the study. And part of that is just overstudy on my part. I've spent too much time looking at this stuff and my mind starting to not work. Um, but we will get sorted through this. Any, any final questions before we close with prayer? Oh, and uh, one other thing before we close with prayer. We're planning on this Sabbath uh, to have a, a study from... 10 to noon, so a Sabbath school in church, um, a study here. And that's so that people in Africa can, uh, in the East African time zone, I think it'll be from uh, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Saturday night, so after Sabbath. Uh, but here it'd be 10 a.m. to noon, because we're 10 hours difference right now because of the time change here. It used to be nine hours. Um, so I'll be sending an email out in that regard. But, uh, 
So we're not sure what we're going to do. We just know that we're going to be doing something this summer. Okay. Um, yeah, I got um, something I need to um, ask <clears throat> before you leave, Theodore. Yeah. And it's uh, um, <clears throat> need to play for Vicky, Steve Woke's wife. I think, it, how do you say his name? Steve. Steve Welk. Well, well, yeah, his wife need to pray for her. Okay. She's okay. Well, let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. We've just presented to ourselves all the problems that we have to sort through, and we know, Lord, your Holy Spirit can help us. Uh, help me in preparing and organizing these things and help others in their personal study so that when we bring these things together, we can see uh, what it is you want us to see. We pray for, uh, I think it's Vicki uh, Welk, Steve Welk's wife, and for her health and for others as well, Lord, who are suffering health problems. Uh, we need uh, your healing in our lives. May your angels watch over us and may you bring us together to study your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>